Hi, I'm Nancy Michael, Director of Undergraduate Studies for the Neuroscience and Behavior major in the College of Science at the University of Notre Dame. I'm excited to share the next few weeks with you as we explore neuroscience and your behavior. Many of us are completely new to this field and just start off with a really simple question. What is neuroscience? As defined by Merriam-Webster, neuroscience is a branch of life sciences that deals with anatomy, physiology, biochemistry, or molecular biology of nerves and nervous tissue, especially with their relation to behavior and learning. So at Notre Dame, we try to capture this really, really special relationship and, and intertwined nature of nervous system function and behavior within our neuroscience and behavior major for our undergraduates. Kind of once we have an understanding of the, what neuroscience is, one might start to wonder what is the purpose of the nervous system, right? And we have this kind of interconnected nature between nervous system function and behavior. So the nervous system really serves as the interface between the outside and inside world. So we're constantly being bombarded with external stimuli, right? touch, taste, smell, hearing, sight, what the environment looks like, who we're with, what we've learned previously in similar contexts. And all of this external stimuli is integrated with our internal sense of self. So how hungry am I? How much sleep have I had? How alert am I feeling? Am I thirsty? And the brain, the nervous system, constantly moment to moment integrates these internal and external world experiences to generate and direct then our next behavioral choices. To be able to have conversations about brain and behavior and how environment influences those functions, uh, it's important to establish some nervous system or neuroscience basics, right? So we'll spend a little bit of time in this video kind of establishing the framework of terminology so that while we have our live time together, we can work towards applying that terminology to actually thinking about integrating these kind of basic science principles in the way that we think about ourselves and our environments and how we engage in the world. So before we even start with terminology, a really easy analogy for a lot of really complicated neuroscience words is gardening, right? We start off with seeds, they grow, the soil matters, the water matters, the sunlight matters, they grow, they get unruly, we prune some stuff back. And the nervous system, particularly with brain development, really isn't a whole lot different. Right? We have basic building blocks, right? The seeds of the nervous system, the seeds of the brain are largely neurons and glial cells. Just like roots and trees, these guys have structure and function relationships. They have particular flow. So we have dendrites up here. Those become like the branches of the tree. The axon is like the trunk of a tree. And the axon terminal, see how there's one axon, but those that axon will bifurcate, right? It has lots and lots and lots of branches, just like roots under the ground that we don't really see. One trunk, lots of roots in lots of directions. There is another cell, particularly astrocytes of the glial cell family that are critically important to communication between neurons, as well as providing nutrients of the neuron and keeping our brain in a very healthy state. Astrocytes um, create what's called the blood brain barrier. They protect us from all kinds of injury and insult over time. But when learning, we have to remember that the brain is actually really a whole lot more complicated than just a couple of cartoons, right? We have approximately 86 billion neurons and 86 billion glial cells in the adult human brain. And so while we show simple cartoons and pictures of single units, we have to remember that the actual connections in the brain form very, very complicated circuits. And the way that these circuits are connected, the way that we have information transfer from one neuron to the next is really what informs the mechanistic underpinning of our behavior. In nervous system development, we start off with just a handful of one cell, right? In an embryonic development, but there's a process called proliferation, right? And proliferation is just expansion of number not only in cell number, right? We proliferate the number of neurons that we have during development, 
but we also proliferate the complexity, right? So this is the process called synaptogenesis when we're talking about cell complexity. Same number of neurons. Again, you can think about these as little itty bitty seeds. And the environments a lot of times will direct how big these branches get. And just like with any tree, right? Sometimes some branches are weak. Sometimes some parts of the tree don't get enough sunlight. And so there's a pruning process as well. And pruning, just like for trees in neurons, can happen at the dendrites. So here's some dendrites on a cell. And you can see after pruning, there are far fewer branches. And then the same thing can happen here at the axon terminals, where earlier on in development or at certain stages of development, there's far more uh, bifurcation and complexity. And then over time, though that complexity will get pruned away for efficiency of the circuit. All of this together create what are called structure function relationships. So we associate dendrites largely with receiving information. We associate dendrites and cell body largely with processing information. We associate the axon largely with sending information. We can look at structure function relationships at the level of the cell. We can also look at structure function relationships at the level of the, the brain itself, at the level of the organ. So we, we talk about different parts of the brain being associated with particular function. And this really develops a very important principle for the, for the longer context of our time together over the next few weeks, that the brain is what's considered a situated organ, right? The brain is born very, very immature and looks to the environment for the relevant information about the appropriate skills and synapses to develop. And so it's not that we have 86 billion neurons and 86 billion glial cells thrown into a bucket in a hodgepodge like you see here, but that they're organized in a very particular way. And then based off of this kind of constant exchange with the environment, both external and internal, the brain develops and grows based on the integration of all of those stimuli. So again, just to revisit, hopefully this was an easy analogy, all right? You can look, at, just think about how, how plants grow, how seeds germinate, um, how they proliferate and pr get pruned back over time. And that will hopefully be helpful in our conversations about these exchanges between brain development and behavior. So what do we have in store for you? Our journey over the next few weeks will be using neuroscience basics as a backdrop to explore questions about ourselves and how deeply our environment and experiences have in, can inform our not only our brain function and behavior, but our biology and our long-term health over time. And then we're gonna close the series with considering how this new information Right. All of these, all of these uh, kind of emerging ideas, emerging data in the terms of the depth of understanding that we have about these environmental behavioral interactions, how might we consider engaging differently in the world? In our first session, we have two fantastic guests for you, um, where we're really going to explore the undergraduate program and really what sets neuroscience and behavior apart at the University of Notre Dame. Any the hundreds of undergraduate institutions offer neuroscience, neuroscience and behavior uh, degree programs. Um, but at Notre Dame, we really try to highlight and provide multiple opportunities for students to engage in their disciplinary expertise, as well as integrating with that, with the service um, to justice mission of the university. Our second section will explore more deeply how experience influences developments and long-term health outcomes with two fantastic scientists on our faculty here um, that explore child adversity um, and stress dose in different systems. And then our third session is gonna 
take a step back from the immediate campus experience and the details of the primary research to consider how do we use these data in service to justice. If we, knew, if we know so much about how environment influences healthy development, how can we use these data to, as a platform for building healthy community? And by the end of our series, I hope that everybody walks away just a little bit shifted in their understanding um, of how deeply the brain really is a situated organ, that these experiences with our environment have a tremendous impact on who we are, how we perceive the world, and that the, our behaviors become an emergent property of brain function. And so how can we use these data not only to gain deeper insight to ourselves, but I believe quite fiercely that understanding brain development and behavior also offers us all the ability to have deeper compassion um, for all of our brothers and sisters. I'm looking forward to the journey. Thanks for taking the time and sharing your time with us.